You are listening to I Am Interchange. I Am Interchange. I Am Interchange. I Am Interchange. Fostering curiosity, education, and empathy by exploring the controversial and the provocative. I Am Interchange. Sarah Blessing admits she's scared. As she faces a life arguably full of options and opportunity, the recent college graduate and founder of the local chapter of the Sunrise Movement feels disillusioned, angry, and yes, afraid. And the climate crisis, the concern on which she expected to focus her attention and efforts, is the proverbial tip of the iceberg. As she examines the world her forefathers built, she sees environmental decimation, income inequality, discrimination, social injustice, cronyism, and a political wasteland directed and bolstered by an aging population that is so concerned with biting the hand that has fed them that they are unable to realize the untenable future they have created for their children and their children's children. And that, really, is the crux of Blessing's problem. How can she realize her only American dream, that of having children, when she is bringing them into an uncertain future? I'm Tay Chamberlain. And in this podcast, my guest Sarah Blessing and I attempt to reconcile the assumptions and concerns, absolutes and possibilities surrounding baby boomers' social, political, and economic legacy and its impact on generations to come. Hello, everybody. Welcome to I Am Interchange. I'm your host, Tate Chamberlain. I'd like to welcome Sarah Blessing, who's going to be on our upcoming event, OK Boomer. How's it going, Sarah? It's going all right. (laughs) Our topic, OK Boomer, is kind of about... That spiteful comment that came about saying, okay, boomer. And there's, in the next 20 or 30 years, there's going to be a huge transfer of wealth, transfer of resources, and transfer of the planet. And so you are on this talk. You're one of the the generations that will be participating in the event. Do you know what the different generations are? Boomers, millennials, Gen X. Those are the ones I'm most familiar with. Yeah, okay. I guess there's probably some over the boomers as well. Yeah, so there's still a handful of the greatest generation. Then there are some misconceptions when people say, okay, boomer. There's actually a really large uh, generation called the silent generation. In between. In between, and then it goes to the baby boomers, Gen X, millennials, Gen Z, and then Gen Alpha. A new one there, too. Yeah, Gen Alpha is... I think their their oldest is maybe seven years old right now. I guess to kind of open it up, what are some assumptions that you have about each of the generations? I guess boomers, I feel like at the moment are, especially in the liberal party, very frightened, like we all are, except they're moving towards something that they think is safe, and that's Joe Biden, and moving back towards the kind of Obama-era policies that we've seen. But I think that's... uh, And I think my whole or the vast majority of my generation sees that as totally backwards. And what we need to do is go forward into creating the society that finally does work for all of us, not just um, kind of the wealthy white few. So Uh, boomers are scared just like everybody else. And they're also they also want to be comfortable. And so they're kind of it's kind of triggering their play it safe Yeah. I mean, I think there's that. But I also think that uh, this idea of the American dream that that we have in America has worked really well for the boomers since they were my age to where they are now. And they, they don't understand the, the difference in society and what young people are up against in, um, trying to make their way in this world. Now it's very different as far as where wealth is positioned and what opportunities are available. A statistic that we'll cover about boomers when they were millennials age in the eighties, they held 21% of America's wealth. And now that millennials are the same age, they hold 3%. So I think that probably references a little bit what what you're talking about. What's a stereotype of uh, Gen X that you kind of have? I honestly, I've I've seen Gen X be some somewhat nihilist and just kind of rebelling against uh, the government and society as it is now. And honestly, that, that brings me a lot of hope because I don't think it works. I think we are kind of in the late stages of capitalism and we're going to need something new really quick, um, whether we like it or not. And I think that Gen X feels that and they feel that nothing really matters <laughs> anymore um, in society the, w- the way that we have it right now. Um, 
and they're just that sense of humor of uh, wanting to die, um, even though, like, it's a joke for, for a lot of us. And I'm kind of on the cusp between millennial and Gen Z. But I think that's sort of a characteristic that I've seen. Um, and just, like, huge mental health issues, obviously, I think accompanied with that, but uh, also just from a society that has nothing substantive in it anymore. How about millennials? I mean, with millennials, I feel like there is kind of the obvious um, stereotype that they're they're lazy, they just can't, they want everything handed to them. And while I see that, I, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's has a, a basis. I think that, like I said, society is just totally different for the way millennials and Gen Zs have had to grow up from from what we've seen in most recent history for other generations and that it's just really difficult. <laughs> you can work three jobs as hard as you can and, and not live the American dream anymore. But I'd also, I think another noticing that I've had of millennials is that they are very obsessed with Facebook and putting their, their personal everything when, I mean, and I, I don't have any judgment, but that's just something that, that I've noticed. <laughs> a lot of their personal stuff Instagram. goes out on uh, mostly Facebook. I feel like Instagram's more of the Gen Z platform. But So uh, Facebook, you're saying, is more millennial? That's that's what I feel like. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. And how about Gen Z? What's kind of an assumption that, that you've heard or have? Uh, I think I got them confused. I was talking more about Gen Z when I, I think you asked me about Gen X. Uh, so that's the one I was thinking more, more oh. nihilist. Yeah, that was my bad. I went out of order. Oh, so Gen Z is the nihilist. And Shane, who's going to be on this event, is Gen Z. And he describes it as kind of waking up to your house being on fire. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And just realizing that this system that's been in place for decades before we were born and that's been organized to work for only a select few people um that is just screwing everyone over including us so let's try gen x again gen x i to be honest don't have many ties with gen x i haven't seen much of them so i'm not sure i have any uh opinions (laughs) at the moment okay so what how about your parents what generation are your parents my parents are baby boomers mine are also what do your parents do um, my dad is a fine artist, and my mom is, uh, well, she's, she's been a stay-at-home mom, but my parents were divorced, so I have two sets now. Okay. And how did you find your way to Montana? I was born here. I was born in Bozeman. Okay. I tried to leave for college, but uh, I ended up coming back to MSU because I love the community in the mountains. Yeah, I love the community also. What are you a student in? Graduated last May in um, geography and geographical information system science from MSU. And what do you hope to do with it? Uh, not much. <laughs> I've uh, really found that I think where I want to be is in policy. And uh, I've just been kind of moving forward with that, with my um, kind of foundation of Gallatin Valley Sunrise and uh, trying to make change in, in the political sphere and be an activist. So you went into college for geography and then it helped kind of propel your activism into the sunrise? Yeah, I suppose I'd, I'd, I'll be using that. Um, and I have used that for my science background of really understanding what's happening with the climate crisis. And that's really influencing my work now. Can we back up for a second? Yeah. What is your relationship to your baby boomer parents? Uh, <laughs> it's a kind of intimate question. Um, we can keep it on to how you described it with with what's going on. It doesn't have to get, right. it's personal it's for me. I, I find, yeah, I, it's hard to, to feel that resentment that I feel, but also know that they're my parents. I mean, with also. me, it's, it's not necessarily a resentment as much because I, I understand that, that boomers, they grew up in a totally different time where we talked about the crises of the world in terms of polar bears dying or uh, parts per million. And that's not something that you can really latch onto. Whereas now we're finally talking about these crises and the ways they impact humans. Like they didn't know what they didn't know. Exactly. And it, like I, I have to, I mean, I think we all have to realize it was a different time, even though a lot more could have been done um, when the alarm bells were sounded. But as far as my parents go, um, I have, I feel like pretty good relationships with them. I have a, one of them has the extreme opposite of ideology that I do. And the other one works to support me all the time. So What's that like? I mean, it's difficult. Uh, it's been really difficult for my sister and I for a really long time. But I've come to this place where uh, I still want 
that parent that disagrees with me on pretty much everything in my life, and I have to find the few ways that we do we do connect. Thanks. Uh, back to the Sunrise Movement. Tell me a little bit about what sparked it. You started it while you were in college, before you graduated. What what kind of lit the fire under you? Yeah, I think what lit the fire under me then was, I mean, I went into college not sure, uh, and this is kind of based on the the difference in ideology of my parents, but not sure if the climate crisis was caused by humans, if it was real or just a hoax um, because of propaganda I'd seen. So while you were in college, you started to question all of that? While I was in college, I mean, I, I was in the earth science department and I created these really great bonds with professors and realized that they they were not trying to um, further some agenda, some conspiracy agenda um, that was climate change. And I, since since I was tiny, since I was a little girl, I, uh, I always wanted babies. Every Christmas I asked my mom for a baby brother and she never, never delivered, but I have always wanted my own family and to have my own kids. And going through my degree, I just realized that um, as I looked forward, all of those moments in my life that I'm so excited for, uh, like telling my mom that I'm pregnant or being able to get married and have a family, they won't be pure joy because I will be scared for any life that I bring into this world, that I can't protect it, and that it will grow up in a world in which I'm not sure that my kids can thrive. So so you, when you were a geography major, your, the propaganda that you thought your teachers might put on you, you realized was pretty real and you should pay attention to it? Yeah, definitely. My, my education had a lot, a lot to do with that and just finding my own voice away from my parents. Um, and then from there, you had this thought of wanting a family someday and that fear kind of built up in you on whether you could bring a, a life into the world that you didn't feel that you could protect. Right. Yeah. I've always wanted a family, but um, when, I, when I learned about what, what's happening in the world, I wasn't sure that I could. And honestly, my work with Sunrise has just made that even more difficult because it's opened my eyes to so many worlds I didn't, um, or so many realities of this world that I didn't know were going on. When did you formally bring on Sunrise Mm -hmm. to your life and into Bozeman? Yeah, I I founded the chapter almost a year ago, just after spring break. I think it was like the 26th of March last year. Can you tell me a little bit about how it inspired you? Yeah, well, I actually have two friends who work for National Sunrise, and uh, they graduated Bozeman High School. And uh, I was just seeing their posts on Facebook, Instagram of the in- incredible and moving work that they were doing in, in D.C. And uh, I just, I really wanted to be a part of it. And so when they came, one of them came home because he happens to be best friends with my partner and uh, talked to me about um, what they were doing. And I got really jazzed up and I was like, I, I really want to help, but I, I can't live in D.C. I don't want to live in a city. So he told me to start start a hub here and uh, it's grown. I, I actually just found out the other day that our our hub is as big as the San Diego hub. Awesome. I went to your first meeting of the year a couple months ago. It was packed. Yeah, yeah, the training, the mini training we had. Uh, do you feel that that will substantially grow? Uh, it has been ever since it started. Uh, just been bringing new people into the movement, and there is a huge appetite, especially in the youth here, to feel like we are doing something and do something with the um, anxiety, depression, and just energy that we have toward fixing the world that's been given to us and that will be passed down. What are some of the key policy issues that the Sunrise Movement supports? Key policy, uh, the big one is the Green New Deal, which we support because it it actually looks at the twin and almost tri crises of our time, and and that is the climate crisis and um, the economic inequality we're seeing, but also the racial injustice that's um, rampant in our society and all parts of this country. I mean, environmental injustice. Um, the climate crisis affects different demographics differently, especially in the beginning, ones that are already economically disadvantaged um, and also just geographically disadvantaged with where we've pushed them to live um, and communities on the front lines, honestly. But uh, the, that's kind of one of the most inspiring parts of a Green New Deal is it also tackles um, Medicare for all, jobs for all, um, housing, safe and equitable housing and really just since the climate crisis demands that we remake kind of the fabric of our society as it is today, 
Um, why not make it so that it works for everyone in a really just and equitable way? Talking about equity, what role does capitalism play in this? Will Will capitalism solve this? Uh, I'm going to say that from pretty much everyone my age um, that I know, and uh, capitalism is the problem. It is not the solution. <laughs> How would you solve it? How would I solve capitalism? How would you solve paying for what we need to do? I mean, that's an incredibly large question that I think um, I'm definitely not like qualified, but I would say that the fact that there are billionaires in this society is insane to me. And I think to many people around me, I think a lot of people don't understand the difference between a millionaire and a billionaire and that there is a huge difference. One sort of uh, visualization of that I like to reference is that a million seconds is about 11 days and a billion seconds is about 31 and a half years. Like it's just, it's insane that we've let billionaires exist or one that I like since I'm in, in geography is that uh, you could earn a dollar the a dollar a day from when the universe was conceived to now and you still wouldn't have as much as the richest people in the world. So what about paying for it though? Right, so tax the rich and then pay for it? Or what, what do you think of companies like Tesla and solar and wind-powered companies that rely on capitalism to develop their technology and make it better and less expensive? I mean, I'm, I'm all for that. I do think there needs to be a dramatic shift in income inequality and where wealth is in this country. And if that's taxation, then that's, I mean, I think it is, it's just taxation. <laughs> but um, I don't know, like I said, that's an incredibly complex question. And I, I, I don't feel qualified to say exactly. I think there are a bunch more qualified people to answer how that will happen. But I know that it does need to happen because we can't have a just and equitable future and a livable future for all of us and escape the drastic consequences of the climate crisis unless we address income inequality and also racial and social injustice. Is there anything that the boomers did right? I mean, I guess a lot of boomers are raising kids that are fired up and ready to take up, take on the establishment and life the way it is and realize that it doesn't have to be this way. I don't know that I know what they did right, but I, I do acknowledge that they lived in a very different time. I mean, yeah, yeah, obviously throughout history, there's been a lot of technological and medical advancement that's really great, but I'm not sure I'd just like give that to the boomers. <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> I just, yeah, I mean, there's always advancement, I guess. What should millennials be most proud of? I don't know. I think in this last election, we've, we've flexed some of our our muscles to be able to get out like youth vote turnout has been a lot higher than it has been in the past. I think that's. Oh, OK. So the, the numbers are significantly higher than they have been. been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think that also, I guess, millennials have in some ways led led the charge of seeking out societal change. Pete Strom, who's going to be on this event after Al Gore raised the alarm in the late 90s about climate. He's Gen X. He went all in on a solar company that was probably too early for its time, but it didn't get enough backing by the government to, to help launch it. How do you feel about that? That sucks. I mean, if we had started making the changes that we need to make that um, back in 1977 when Exxon knew that we were barreling toward a climate crisis that was going to reshape everything about society – the changes we would, ha would have had to make would be basically ne negligible compared to what we need to do now. Are there people in every generation that have done something about it enough? I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm not like I don't want to attack people. I think I, I want to attack the uh, the Koch brothers, the fossil fuel billionaires that um, the Koch brother. Co right. The brother. <laughs> <laughs> but while we can acknowledge that there's one less brother their combined net worth is now still, well, the, the one left still has $86 billion. It's still reasons. influencing a lot. Yeah, his legacy lives on and he still has $86 billion reasons to stagnate process on, on climate justice as well as um, use all that money to basically act as an, a, a third party in American politics, which is pretty unprecedented. How angry should people be? Really angry. <laughs> I guess a metaphorical cliff 
is there middle ground to be found when it seems like we're heading towards that metaphorical cliff? I don't think so. I mean, I Sunrise Movement focuses a lot on, on climate, but we're also facing so many different injustices that make me so angry. Um, injustices toward people of color, injustices um, just kind of all over the spectrum, economic everywhere, and just nothing, nothing works. <laughs> I think we should all be angry and we should all be kind of devastated about how, where we've allowed society to be. I don't, middle ground I feel like is ignorant. Although I, I do realize that people process, um, process things differently and I'm not really an angry person, but, um, I, I do get fired up and I do also feel devastated about where we are right now. Should things get more drastic if Trump is elected for another term? I, I do believe that they will. Um, and do you mean more drastic as his administration will be more drastic or our response needs to be more drastic? Should the response be more drastic? The response should be drastic no matter who gets elected. It's looking more and more like Joe Biden might get the nomination. Do you think that Biden will do enough for your movement? In any other modern country, Biden would be a Republican, not a Democrat. But he was for the Paris Agreement. If we The Paris Agreement is kindergarten compared to where we need to be. Okay, so even if we entered back into the Paris Agreement, it's not going to be enough? No, not by a long, 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 long shot. <laughs> so back to you having your kids... Do you think younger generations should have kids or should they put the pause button and what would that mean? Gosh, I don't know. That's also a really tough one. And I struggle with that myself. Like, should I have kids or should I not? I don't know. For like, obviously there's a, there's a debate about your carbon footprint once you bring in a new life into the world. But for me, it's just, is it ethical knowing what I know is coming in our future to bring life into that? So I think that's just a subjective choice that I hope everyone looks at what actually is happening and can make for themselves. Is there anything about this topic that you hadn't considered? Um, I, I, don't, I hadn't considered the, the transition of wealth that you're talking about. Really, that wasn't really in my sphere until you approached me about this opportunity. But unfortunately, um, I feel like that's too late to really make a difference. Like right now, with the way that the Western world is consuming resources, I, I don't expect our society the way it is now to live past a decade. So there are, there's a couple of statistics. I think if you include the silent generation and baby boomers, there's an estimated $68 trillion of wealth being transferred in the next 30 years. But you're saying that's too far off for the action that we need now. That's way too far off for the action we need now, I would say. But I also just, I'm not sure Based on what I know um, and what I've seen through my research and working in this field for the last year, I don't expect society to look anything like it does now within a decade. Will younger generations know how to manage that much money having not really earned it, having it be passed down? The younger generations have held 3%, but there's the lion's share coming our way, which is 80%. Will we know how to manage that kind of money? You got to look at the spread, like how many people is the lion's share of that 80% getting passed down to? Yeah, it's actually supposed to get worse. The 21 to 3% is supposed to get worse with the next transition of wealth. Yeah, no, I I believe it. I, uh, to be honest, I, I'm not worried about that because I don't, um, I don't foresee society working like it does now. I think it will be totally reshaped. Yeah, it'll re be reshaped. But does it, won't it take money to do that? Maybe. <laughs> How would you solve it without money? I think, I mean, I, I don't know. And I know that in my mind, I tend toward kind of this catastrophism of looking into the future. But um, I don't know. I don't know that money will be worth anything. <laughs> okay. Do you have faith in humanity? Sometimes. <laughs> do you have faith in humanity when the goal is as large as it is? Um, something my mom says is, uh, humans don't just lay down their lives. So I, I guess I do in, to some extent, like when there's been intense 
problems in the past and even what we're seeing with like coronavirus like things are shut down and we have the ability to do that and to make huge changes to daily life as usual and business as usual if if we choose to but i i honestly think it's going to take a long a long time for people to really understand what needs to be done because a lot of wealthy white people are going to have to die before anyone takes notice sarah blessing thanks a lot for being here i'm really looking forward to our may 7th event okay boomer thanks for being here Yeah, thanks for having me. As Blessing passionately iterates, we can't have a just and equitable future and a livable future for all of us and escape the drastic consequences of the climate crisis unless we address income inequality and also racial and social injustice. The problems are all connected and Blessing argues that capitalism is at its root. While the past generations didn't know what they didn't know, They do now. We do now. And if the world is to be a place of life and prosperity, indeed a place where children can and should be born, then change must come, and it must be drastic. The Paris Agreement is not enough. Biden, who would be a Republican in any other modern country, is not enough. The future demands policy change to the likes of the Green New Deal. It demands leaders the likes of Bernie Sanders. It demands grassroots movements. It demands that the youth find their voice and use it. It demands that we remake the fabric of our society in a way that works for everyone. A special thank you to Susan Karstensen, Zogolo Coffee House, Whistlepig Korean, The State of Montana, Ben Johnson Photography, Loken Productions, Superfluous Industries, and Blunderbuss. A shout out to our editors and media team, Pat Loken, Joseph Sandoval, Allison Gregory, Shannon Hughes, Jessica Byerly, Jacob Desch, Nathaniel Johns, and Nicholas Hill. Do you have an issue that's riddled by gridlock in your community? We want to hear from you. Shoot me a message at tate at iaminterchange.org. That's tate at iaminterchange.org. Until next time, share airtime and don't ruin dinner.